marvel of the great Redeemer, who is doing so much for me. With a joy I tell the story of the love that makes men free. Till my earthly life is ended, I will sing, I will sing songs of love, songs of love. And beside the crystal sea, more and more my soul shall be praising Jesus and His love. He is everything to me, to me. He is He's everything to me. To me. supporting characters from the supporting cast in, in the narratives of the Gospels. And so uh, in this series, we've looked at John the Baptist. We've talked about Mary and Joseph. Uh, last Sunday, we spent some time with, with Peter. And, and today, we're talking about John. And, and I'd like for you to fill in the blank for me here. John is known as the apostle of what? John is known as, as the apostle of, of love. And if our theme this year, which it is, is, is love first, John is probably someone that, that we should pay a little attention to. In fact, uh, in our next, next month, we're going to be looking at the epistle of 1 John because the theme of 1 John is, is how we should love one another. And, and we're going to see how love is just woven through that, those five chapters of, of the book of 1 John, and it just ties everything together. Let's read about this great apostle of love as, as we encounter him in the Gospels. Look with me at, at Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 35. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. I, I want you to see uh, what a loving person John was from the very beginning. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They, re they replied, let one of us set at your right and the other on your left in your glory. 
You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to set at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to who, to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with James and John. Well, well that doesn't sound very loving to me. Maybe, maybe I have the wrong reference. I, I apologize. Let's, perhaps I meant uh, to take us to Mark chapter 9. So, so turn back one chapter. This has to be it. Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 51. Teacher said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he's not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for the one who does a miracle in my name, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Well, this is embarrassing. That, that can't be the right text either. That, that doesn't sound like an apostle of love. That doesn't sound very loving. Maybe I didn't mean Mark chapter 9. Maybe, let's go to, to Luke chapter 9. I, I must be in the wrong gospel. Uh, Luke chapter 9. Look, look with me at uh, ch- verses 51 through 55. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead. He went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. What's going on here? (laughs) Well, since we read these passages, let's, let's deal with them. Three snapshots of the apostle of love that that aren't very flattering. This is like when you look at a picture of yourself and you think, oh, that that just doesn't look very good. That that doesn't do me any any favors. Well, here's three snapshots of John that that don't do him any favors. If if he's to be known as the apostle of love, these these don't sound like very loving incidents in his life. And and the request that James and John make in in Mark chapter 10, it, it sounds pretty bad. It's even worse when you locate that text and that request in its original context because in the preceding verses, in, in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, it tells him that tells us that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he's not going as a conquering king. He's going as a suffering servant. He predicts his death for the third time. He, he predicts his death. He, he says, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the chief priest and, and to the elders. Uh, and they will condemn him and hand him over to the Gentiles, and they're going to, to mock him and flog him and spit on him and kill him. Now, either James and John don't hear Jesus, don't understand Jesus, or somehow misinterpret his words. The words out of their mouth are, Lord, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's what they say in response to Jesus predicting his own death. And when Jesus asked them what favor it is that they're calling in, they say, well, we want to set at your right and your left when you come into glory. They're they're still envisioning an earthly kingdom run according to to human norms. Uh, They want to be the the crown princes who are sitting next to Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. And, And this disrespects Jesus, and it also angers their fellow disciples. And in verse 41, it says, the others were indignant. The ten were indignant with James and John. And the thing is, they're not really mad because they've disrespected Jesus. They're, they're Most likely, they're angry because James and John are asking for what they all want for themselves. This place of honor. There's not much love that's being shown here by the apostle of love. It's, it's not a very flattering picture. Well, let's look at this next scene. Uh, here's a snapshot of John who's, who's wanting to stop an unfamiliar exorcist. And, and just like the story in, in chapter 10, now this is even more flattering when you see the larger context. In the ancient world, exorcists would use whatever name worked when they were trying to cast out demons. Uh, whatever name would bring success, that would be the name that they would use. And so apparently there's this exorcist who's found some Success driving out demons using the name of Jesus. Now, he's not a disciple. He's not a follower of Jesus. He just has discovered that Jesus' name has power. 
And so John comes across this opportunist and tells him to, to stop. And, and John says, he's not one of us. That's why we stopped him. He's not one of us. And he's expecting commendation from Jesus, but instead he receives condemnation. Jesus tells him, don't, don't stop this man. And Jesus is really practical about this. He says, no one who, who performs wonders in my name can in the next breath be saying something bad about me. This isn't someone who's going to accuse Jesus of, of working for Beelzebub, as some of the teachers of Jerusalem had done. And so here's why this is a problem for the Apostle John. This is why the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love, isn't acting very lovingly here. First of all, he's more concerned with boundary markers than he is with helping hurting people. I mean, people are, say what you want to say about this, this exorcist, people are being delivered from demonic possession and bondage. And by the way, do, do boundary markers ever prevent us from truly helping the hurting? I mean, churches build these type of fences all the time. Now, we're not going to work with this or that denomination because they don't believe what we believe. We don't believe what they believe. They're not part of us. And we're not part of them. And Jesus is just talking about delivering people, helping people, offering a, a cup of cold water, as he says. John's interested in, in erecting these boundary markers. And, and John's other problem is the problem of, of hypocrisy. See, earlier in this same chapter, the very same chapter, John and the other disciples were unsuccessful in an exorcism that they attempted. And so Jesus had, had to do it. And when the disciples asked Jesus why they failed, Jesus told them, he said, this kind can only come out by prayer. And so now John encounters someone who is successful in ex exercising demons. Do you, do you think maybe there's some jealousy in play here? That here's this person who's not one of them, but he's able to do what the disciples failed to do earlier in the, same, the very same chapter. You would expect a little bit more from an apostle of love. And then the third unflattering snapshot of, of John also occurs on the way to Jerusalem. And, and this is also a bad look. There's a Samaritan village, and, and they fail to, to welcome Jesus. And so James and John, the sons of thunder, as they're called, they, they've got a simple solution. Jesus, let's, why don't you just allow us to call down fire from heaven, and we will destroy this, this village. We'll just level it, wipe it out. How did John go from a son of thunder to an apostle of love? I, I had a church member that, that uh, recently, a few years ago, gave me a book entitled The Meanest Man in Texas. I don't know if any of you have, have seen that book or, or read it. I think they made a movie out of it here fairly recently. But it's a true story. It's about a man named Clyde Thompson, who was born in, in Oklahoma in 1910. This was during the, 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 the oil boom, uh, but later his family moved to, to Texas. He, he dropped out of school in fourth grade, and it wasn't long after that that he committed his first murders. And I say first murders because Later on, while in prison, he committed two more. He killed at one point a prison guard, also killed a fellow inmate on another occasion, just kept stacking up life sentences, had three life sentences stacked on top of one another. At one point when he was in prison, he received a Bible. I think it was just given to him to keep him from going mad during a period when he was in solitary confinement. He started reading it just to... <laughs> maintain his own sanity to have something to, to keep his attention, but he really started out reading it, trying to find the errors and the contradictions within the Bible. But the more that he read, the more he was convicted. He found out that God was true and he was false, just like Scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. That's what he discovered. He ended up writing to a preacher in Dallas, asking him to come baptize him. By the time the preacher got there, he had three other inmates that they themselves were ready to give their lives to, to Jesus. In 1946, he received a Christmas card from a church member, a young Christian lady named Julia Perryman. And they began to, to exchange letters, and she was convinced of, of his changed heart and, and life, and so she started a tireless letter-writing campaign on his behalf, asking that he be paroled. Finally, the parole board eventually did grant him a release in 1955. Clyde and Julia got married. They stayed married their entire lives. Clyde worked with a number of churches, including the Sunset Church of Christ in Lubbock as a prison minister. He directed, at one point, the Navajo, Christian, or Navajo Children's Home in New Mexico, worked at Southwest Christian College in, in Terrell, Texas, uh, for a time, led over 400 people to the Lord. Someone that they called the meanest man in Texas. 
becomes a great evangelist. If we don't believe that, that lives can be changed, we don't, we don't believe in the power of the gospel. The meanest man in Texas could become a great evangelist. A son of thunder can become an apostle of, of love. And so let's talk about the steps. How, how do we grow in love? How do we experience that, own, that type of change in, in our own lives? Well, first, we, we learn about love. We, we do what we've been doing through, throughout this year. It's interesting. Many believe that, that John the Apostle was a cousin of Jesus. Now, we know John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus, but John... The apostle was a son of Zebedee. Matthew chapter 27 tells us that, that the mother of Zebedee's children was standing near the cross. And Mark calls her Salome. And John calls her, Mark, John calls her Mary's sister. And so you put those texts together and, and it would seem that, that John is perhaps a first cousin of Jesus. And so Jesus calls his, his cousins, James and John, to follow him, and to follow him means to go where he goes and, and to listen to his teaching and to, to learn, to travel with him and to learn from him. And, and the first lesson that, that, that John would have picked up from, from day one was about love. In fact, love is the theme that runs consistently throughout John's writings. And he sums it all up by, by giving and repeating Jesus' new command that you love one another as, as I have loved you, so you should love one another, is what Jesus told his, his followers. And Jesus added love others, we know, to the Shema of Judaism. And, and John said it this way in his writings. He says, whoever has loved God must also love his brother. And so John and Jesus tied those two things together, and John learned that from Jesus. John learned about love from Jesus but we all know that learning about love isn't the same as living lovingly. Uh, we know that, that knowing isn't the same as doing. And so the, the second step is to know that you are loved. Scott McKnight says, nothing is more important for the development of love than being loved. We may be, be taught the importance of love, but to experience it is to know it. There's a man, a minister named Paul Yanji Cho. He, he preached in the largest congregation in the world, a Korean church. And there became, came a point where his ministry became international. He once prayed a prayer to the Lord. He said, Lord, I will go anywhere you want to preach the gospel, but I won't go to Japan. See, that was his Nineveh. Those were his Ninevites. And that was because of what Japanese troops had, had done to his own family during the Second World War. And there was this gut level, level loathing that he had within him. But just like Jonah in the Old Testament, sure enough, he was called to go and, and preach to Japan, the one place that he didn't want to go. He, he went and spoke at a pastor's conference in Japan. A thousand church leaders were in attendance at that conference. And Paul Yanji Cho gets up into the pulpit and he looks out in the crowd of all of these faces of, of Japanese church leaders, and he just, he just loses it. He just blurts out what was in his heart at the time. He said, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Can you imagine a preacher saying that from the pulpit? And after he spoke those words, he, he just breaks down right there in the pulpit and, and sobs. One church leader in the audience stands up. And then another and another. And then one by one, they, they came up on stage. And they embraced Paul Yanji Cho and asked for his forgiveness. And he finished his message and he closed it with the words, I love you, I love you, I love you. The way that John experienced love was that he was loved through his Failures. We, we talk a lot about deny, Peter denying Jesus three times and, and his restoration. We don't talk as much about Paul, uh, John's three failures and th those three snapshots that, that we just spoke about. John was pretty cranky and pretty crusty himself before Jesus' love broke into his life. And it was his proximity to Jesus that, that made all the difference. I mean, you think about the things that, that John was involved in when Jesus went to the synagogue ruler's 
house to heal his daughter. He takes John along with him. John was there at the Mount of Transfiguration. John was in the Garden of Gethsemane. How close, just how close was John able to get to Jesus? I want you to listen to these words. This is from the, the King James Version of, of John chapter 13, verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. It, this verse is interesting for a couple reasons. It's the first time John describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, if, if in fact he is referring to himself. Most believe that he is. But also notice that the proximity. He, he's leaning on Jesus' bosom. And it, and John has used that expression, a similar expression, once before in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, verse 18, we read this. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. That's interesting because John wants to be as close to Jesus as Jesus was to God. That's pretty close. Anyone who gets that close to Jesus is going to be, is bound to be, changed and shaped by his love. And so for me, the application of that is if we want to grow in love, we've got to lean into Jesus. The closer we are to, to Jesus, the, the more we will grow in his love. That, that's the path. The, the more that we absorb his love, the more that, that we're shaped and formed by it. And we, through that, we learn to, to love others. I mean, John goes from Mr. Call Down Fire from Heaven, Mr. Thunderbolt, to writing about the transformative power of love in his writings. You think about the changes in his life, that, that John abandoned this idea that, that he should have the, the seat of prominence, that he should set it at Jesus' right hand. And when he writes John, he doesn't even identify himself. He just gives himself one name, one moniker, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, he said, I'm not going to identify myself based on my own standings, based on my own importance, based on my own resume. I'm going to identify myself as one who is loved by Christ. And then he writes this great theology of love, the book that we'll be studying from next month. The epistles of John make up about 2% of the New Testament, and yet they contain 20% of all the instances of the word love. But it's not just about its usage, it's about its centrality. See, John learned from the very beginning that, that Jesus wanted his followers to, to love God and to love others. And, and the closer we get to him, the more we learn also to do those two things. Let me ask you a couple personal questions as we close today. What do people say about your temper? Ah, uh, he's such a hothead. She flies off the handle. What do people say about your capacity to love? Uh, he only cares about himself. He doesn't care about anyone else. Uh, she doesn't let anyone into her circle. Do you realize that, that you could change? And John did. John went from someone who was a son of thunder to someone who was an apostle of love. Love can be learned. And the way that we learn to love is, is that we continually lean into Jesus. It's through our proximity to him that we learn to love God more and we learn to love others more. Since the love of God is shared, priceless blessings on my head, I have made, I have made it my own. In my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule. It shall rule.
sing the love of God will never fail or lose His glory till we see Him face to face. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne. Charlotte and I lived out in South Carolina. I was experiencing a pretty rough day at work. One of those days where despite everything I did, I just couldn't seem to get anything checked off my to-do list. All the while, I kept getting more and more and more put on me. If my day had been officiated, I'm pretty sure a flag would have been thrown for piling on. <laughs> It got to the point where I felt like just raising a big white flag in surrender and throwing up my hands and saying, no moss, no moss, I give, I give. But instead, I decided to take a late lunch and go out in my car and just drive around and try to regroup. And while I was out driving around, I had the radio on. Now, I admit a lot of times when I had the radio on, I don't focus 
on the words of the song, but this day I did. And on the radio came a song that most of us are familiar with. It was a song by Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water. And if you know the song, you know it's a very touching, heartfelt song from one friend to another, where one friend tells the other, look, when you're weary, when you're down, when you're struggling, when you have no one else to turn to, just know that I'm by your side. I'm here for you. In fact, I'm willing to lay down my life for you like a bridge over troubled water. And when I heard the words of that song, given the rough day I'd been having, I just blurted out, boy, sure would be nice to have a friend like that. No sooner did I get those words out of my mouth that the, that the thought hit me. Scott, you do have such a friend. His name is Jesus. And then the words from a, a song that I've been singing since childhood came to mind. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. This morning, as we partake of the Lord's Supper together, I invite you to join me in reflecting on the friend we have in Jesus. A friend who loves us more than we'll ever know or be able to comprehend. A friend who's willing to be by our side through thick and thin. A friend who is willing to die on the cross for you and me, laying down his life like a bridge over that large gulf of sin that separated us from God, allowing us to cross over and be reconciled and reunited with our Father and our God to enjoy a very intimate Abba Father relationship for this current life and for the life to come. Oh, what a gift. Oh, what a God. Oh, what a Savior. Let's pray together. Father, as we think about the fact that the creator of the universe was willing to give up his life through his son for us, we're so humbled. And Lord, we just thank you so much for that gift. And thank you so much for your love for us and for the fact that your son died for us so that we can have our sins forgiven and be reunited with you to enjoy a very intimate Abba Father relationship. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your son. Father, as we partake of this loaf, which represents Christ's body, crucified on the cross for us, may we do so in a manner that pleases you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's again pray together for the cup. Father, as we prepare to partake this cup, which represents Christ's blood shed for us, we just thank you for the cleansing that takes place through the gift of your Son and the washing of through his blood. And for the righteousness that we're imputed from Christ so that we can again enjoy an Abba Father intimate relationship with you. Thank you for loving us and thank you for meeting our need through your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Trials are on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But He'll guide us with His eye and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by and by. And we're singing by and by. And by. When the morning comes, you know all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Have prevailed, and we 
wandered in the darkness, heavy hearted and alone, but we're trusting in the Lord, and according to His word, we will understand it better by and by. Understand it better by and by and by. Temptations in his often take us unawares, and our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test, when we try to do our best, we will understand it better by and by. Understand it better by and by and by. And we're singing by and by, and by when the morning comes. You know all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story how to overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Shout